This is chapter 11, water use and pollution. First, we will examine water usage, then we will examine water pollution. Water is one of our most poorly managed resources. People waste it and people pollute it. And some analysts say that we charge too little for making water available. And this chart here shows you the average indoor household water use. So 20% of the water used at home goes into using the toilet. 19% is clothing wash, washer. 19% is shower, 19% is faucets, 14% is from leaks, unintentional leaking from pipes and from leaky faucets, for example. A bath would be 5%, the dishwasher is 1%, and other miscellaneous would be 3%. So I like to show that video because I think it's pretty powerful, the message that we are using lots and lots of water without even thinking about it while, let's say, brushing your teeth or if you're going to shave by the sink, um, things like that, or washing dishes and you, you may leave the faucet running for a couple of minutes without actually using that water. <clears throat> so compare that to people in other countries who may have a very difficult time getting water and um, it's pretty powerful, uh, the message in this video. So only a small percent of the Earth's water is available to use as a freshwater resource. About 0.024% is readily available to us as liquid fresh water in accessible groundwater deposits and in lakes and streams. So where do we retrieve fresh water from? It comes from the groundwater and it comes from surface water. But a, so you see a small percentage is actually readily available and accessible. The rest of the water on earth is salt water, glacial ice, or it's so deep underground that we can't access it, or it's in other inaccessible locations. And fresh water is not distributed evenly. Different areas of the world have different climate zones, which we talked about in a previous chapter. And that is the amount of precipitation and evaporation and the temperature that varies around the world. And the evaporation is going to go along with the temperature, for example. So you see here this chart, this map shows you differences in average annual precipitation in the US. And you see that more precipitation happens on the East Coast all the way into kind of the Midwest, and then all the way on the West Coast. But you have a large percentage of the middle of the country where they get a lower amount of precipitation.
Besides climate, there are other factors involved in why some areas have more water resources than others. So some regions of the world have natural contamination in their drinking water. For example, Bangladesh, parts of Bangladesh, um, parts of India as well, have natural contamination of some of their groundwater. And it comes from arsenic that's in the sediments naturally in the ground. And that could leach into the groundwater. And parts of New England actually also have a very similar problem with their groundwater that's coming in contact with granite bedrock and it leaches arsenic from the bedrock and that can go and contaminate the groundwater. And some areas of the world have very small number of rivers and lakes and that's just due to local geology and local topography. For example, parts of Africa have very, very little number of streams, very small number of lakes. Some areas around the world have deep water tables where it's very difficult to reach the groundwater. And then in contrast, regarding the rivers, the United States has many, many rivers. We've got many rivers, many small streams that go through most of the country. So you see in that way, it is pretty unequal the way that rivers are distributed around the world. And then it, that go, same thing goes for lakes as well. And then the deep water table just means that you would have to dig very, very deep in order to access that groundwater. Such differences divide the world into water haves and have nots. And another example is Canada with only 0.5% of the world's population has 20% of the world's liquid fresh water supply while China, with 19% of the world's people, has only 7% of the supply of fresh water on Earth. So where is fresh water found? Again, it's found in groundwater, or it's found as groundwater underground, or it is also found as surface water. So groundwater is one of our most important sources of fresh water. And it comes from precipitation that passes down into the ground. And the precipitation will seep into spaces, which are called pore spaces. And those spaces are going to be in between particles of soil, gravel, things like that, different types of sediment. Or you might have cracks in the rock underground that will fill in with water. And all of that is going to be considered to be groundwater. And this is a cross-section of underground. And it shows you the zone of saturation is the section underground where all of the pore spaces are completely filled in with water. And that's represented by blue fill, filling in the cracks in the rock, where it says fractured rock. Okay, those are all cracks in the rocks. And then here you have sand and gravel and all of the spaces in between the sand and gravel is filled in with blue. So they're showing you that that is all saturated with water. And the top of the saturation zone is the water table. So that's here. And then above the water table, the most of the pore spaces are filled with air. And then this diagram is showing you rain hitting the ground and passing down into the ground and then settling in the zone of saturation. So an aquifer is an underground source of water and that could include layers of sand and gravel or fractures in bedrock or even underground caverns or caves. And then when the groundwater collects in these empty spaces, 
it is a source of water underground. So that's an aquifer. So surface water is fresh water that comes from precipitation and from snow melt that flows on the Earth's surface, and that's as surface runoff. And it's going to flow into bodies of water like lakes, wetlands, streams and rivers, and estuaries, and ultimately to the oceans. Now, the ocean, when it reaches the ocean, it's going to become salt water. And when it reaches the estuaries, it becomes brackish water, where it mixes with salt water. And then we have something called a drainage basin. A drainage basin is also called a watershed. And what that is, is all of the surface runoff that falls on an area of land that eventually ends up in one main river or an estuary. So in this case, the red outline shows you the entire watershed of this particular river in Romania. So all of this green land inside the red outline all of the surface runoff eventually ends up in this main river that goes down the middle. So this whole entire section outlined in red is the watershed or the drainage basin. And sometimes you'll see a sign that indicates what watershed a tributary stream is part of. So here in, this was in New Paltz, New York, there was a little stream called the Wallkill River and it's a tributary to the Hudson River estuary. And I know that because the sign tells us that this river was in the watershed of the Hudson River estuary. So sometimes you'll, if you're driving around, you might see a sign on the side of the road. If you're passing over a river, there might be a sign that tells you what watershed you're in. So it could be the Passaic River, you know, it could be the Chesapeake Bay or the Chesapeake Estuary. It could be the Hudson River Estuary. You know, there's different um, watersheds around the country, around the world as well. So what do we use most of the water that we withdraw from the ground for? Or withdraw from surface water? 70% of the water that we withdraw from rivers, lakes, and aquifers goes to irrigation of farmland. 20% goes to industrial use, and 10% goes to residences for household use. Affluent lifestyles require large amounts of water. You have people with swimming pools or hotels with swimming pools, gyms that have swimming pools, Golf courses require a lot of water because they're gonna water the grass. This picture here is a fountain. Fountains use water. Lawns, people with lawns are gonna, that's gonna require watering and bathing often. Some countries, it's not typical to bathe very often some countries, it's more typical for people to bathe pretty often. And then we have this concept, water footprints and virtual water. So water footprint is a measure of the volume of fresh water that we use directly and indirectly to keep us alive and to support our lifestyle. The average American directly uses about 69 gallons of fresh water daily. That is enough to fill almost two bathtubs full of water. Virtual water is water used to produce food and other products. So if we look at this diagram here, we can see how many bathtubs full of water each of these products requires for production and transport. So here is one cup of coffee. One cup of coffee requires a whole entire bathtub full of water to produce and transport. 
one loaf of bread takes four bathtubs full of water. Here, these jeans, a pair of jeans, take 72 tubs of water. One hamburger takes 16 bathtubs full of water. So you see, you're not directly using the water. It's virtual water or indirect water. Okay, so it's virtual because it's kind of like in the background of the production of the product. You're not directly drinking or bathing in that water, but that water got used up in the consumption of or in the production of whatever product you are using or eating. So then we're gonna get into water scarcity. The main factors that cause water scarcity in any area are a dry climate, drought, too many people using a water supply more quickly than it can be replenished. And when we talk about replenishing water supplies, we're mainly talking about precipitation and also the wasteful use of water. And more than 30 countries, mainly in the Middle East and Africa, now face water scarcity. So we're gonna take a closer look at drought situations in California. So the most recent major drought that California experienced was a five year long drought from 2012 to 2016. And some problems associated with drought include risks of wildfires, drinking water shortages, ranches that go dry, which affects livestock grazing, and also groundwater aquifers can end up taking years, many, many years to replenish. And the replenishment, again, is coming from precipitation. And that includes snowmelt as well. So snowmelt is from snow that falls in the colder months. And then eventually the snow melts when it gets warmer out. And then that snow melt is going to add fresh water into your surface water and into your groundwater aquifers. But aquifers specifically can take many, many, many years to replenish. It could take longer than just filling back in surface water because the water has to percolate down into the ground. And there might be clay layers underneath the ground that are preventing water from passing down into the aquifers. There's different aspects involved there. So snowmelt from mountainous areas is a major source of fresh water in California. For example, from the Sierra Nevada mountains. And after January 2020 was the hottest January on record, the snowpack is actually about 58% below normal for February. And this is from an article that was, that was written in February. And you can see in the next slide, there were images taken from Northern California that show the, the, the um, minimal amount of snow cover. Okay, so on the left is snow cover in 2019, and on the right is snow in 2020. So you see there's a lot less snow, and this is, these images are from February 2019 and February 2020. So you see a lot less snow. So then as it gets warmer out, you have less snow to melt and replenish the surface water and groundwater. So you're going to see more drought situation because you're going to have less freshwater input. A similar issue 
is seen in parts of the Himalayan mountains, for example, in Nepal. So there are areas where snowmelt is the main source of freshwater recharge to lakes and streams. So now with climate change and you know, the climate getting warmer in some areas, it's more sensitive. So glacial ice in the Himalayan mountains is more sensitive to climate change and global warming. So you have changes in your snow patterns there. So less snow in the winter is leading to less freshwater supply the rest of the year. Similarly to California, a lot of areas in the Himalayan mountains rely on the snowmelt for their freshwater supply. So there are different ways that we could increase freshwater supplies. So we could use both groundwater and surface water. We could build dams and reservoirs, which store runoff in rivers, and then you release whatever amounts of water you need as needed. We can move surface water from one area to another. We can convert salt water to fresh water in a process called desalination. Or we can reduce unnecessary waste of fresh water. So groundwater is being withdrawn faster than it is replenished in some areas. And that causes the water tables in those areas to fall. When a water table falls, it means you have to dig deeper into the ground in order to access the groundwater. And that could happen because the rate of pumping water from aquifers exceeds the rate of, rate of recharge from rainfall and snowmelt. And mostly the excessive pumping of water out of the aquifers is usually due to irrigating crops. And this is called groundwater overdraft, when groundwater use exceeds the amount of recharge into the aquifer. And you could read more information about groundwater overdrafts on this link here related to the western part of the United States. And this shows you satellite photos of farmland that was irrigated by groundwater. And the groundwater is actually an ancient aquifer that's non-renewable. And it's in a desert region of Saudi Arabia. So on the left is, <clears throat> is an image from 1986. And on the right is 2004. The irrigated areas are shown by green dots. The brown dots are areas where wells have gone dry and the land has returned to desert. So I don't know if you can see in here, but there are a whole bunch of brown dots. Okay, but if you, if you see before the irrigation started, it's pretty much a desert in that region, right? So for a while, it wasn't desert because of the irrigation. And you still have a lot of areas that are green still, but the brown dots are where they basically have pumped too much water out of those aquifers and the wells have gone dry. So this is not sustainable farming here. The climate does not, cannot sustain the irrigation that they're, that they're using. And this is groundwater overdrafts in the US. So you can see we have high overdrafts in this red section here, here, little smaller red sections. And then moderate overdraft is in yellow. So what are some harmful effects of overpumping aquifers? As the water tables drop, farmers must drill deeper wells, 
buy larger pumps and use more electricity to run those pumps. So withdrawing large amounts of groundwater can cause the sediments in aquifers to become compacted. This causes the land above the aquifer to sink, which is called land subsidence, and it can lead to the formation of sinkholes, which are basically holes in the ground. Once sediments in an aquifer become compressed by subsidence, recharge is impossible. So what this is saying is, let's say you have sand and gravel underground. The sand and gravel have water in between, as I showed you earlier. When you take that water out, the sand and gravel is able to get more compacted together and like more closely, uh, closely compacted, right? So you're, when you're compacting the land, the land is gonna start to sink. If you're talking about a whole large area of land with all of the sand and gravel underneath the ground all compacting together, the land actually starts to sink. And once that sand and pebbles, let's say the sand grains go in between the pebbles, you're filling in space so then it's not gonna hold water any longer in those spaces because it's filled with sand. And because everything's getting more compacted together. So you can no longer hold as much water underground that you were as what you were able to before. So this shows you in the San Joaquin Valley in California, land subsidence. So what happened was they removed groundwater for irrigation and it caused the poorly consolidated sediments underground to become compacted. So if you see the bottom of the pole says 1977, the top of the pole says 1925. So what's happening is they marked the pole to show you that at the 1925 label, that is the that's actually where the elevation of the land used to be in the year 1925. So the land used to actually be up here where it says 1925. And then in 1955, the elevation of the land used to be here at 1955. And then when this photo was taken, the elevation of the land is now nine meters lower than what it was in 1925. And that's all because of the sediments underneath the ground becoming more compacted together as they kept removing a lot of the groundwater. And you could read through the rest here. This just shows you um, the same area, pretty much. So here is where we're looking and then we have the land subsidence enlarged here. So this is between 1926 and 1970 and greater than eight and a half meters of land subsidence is in here. These, the darker spot right in the middle there. And then 7.3 to 8.5 is that maroon color. So it's not a very large area. It's not like half of California or anything. It's a small area, but still that small area has lost elevation, almost, you know, almost nine meters of elevation. And keep in mind, one meter is about three feet. And here is a little bit of an update. So this is showing you in 1988, where the elevation was, and this is 2004, and that's 2008, and this is 2013. So between 1988 and, and 2013, they lost about 4.8 feet. Okay, so they're still experiencing loss of elevation in the land. And that's also in the San Joaquin Valley.
Now, another harmful effect of over pumping groundwater is that if you're in a coastal area, you may end up contaminating the well with salt water. And that's called saltwater intrusion. So here on the left is a typical well where you're bringing in fresh water up into the well. And the salt water stays below the fresh water because salt water is denser than fresh water. And fresh water and salt water do not mix typically. And then all the way to the right, you have if you're over pumping the water in the well, then you end up taking up that salt water because you you're take you took up too much of that fresh water. So now you're starting to pull up the salt water. And then the middle diagram is just showing you what happens if sea level rises. If sea level rises, you're gonna flood the wells with seawater as well. So here are some solutions for groundwater depletion. You could read that on your own. Okay, so now we have dams. Large dams and reservoirs have advantages and disadvantages. Dams are structures built across rivers to block some of the flow of water. Dammed water usually then creates a reservoir which is water storage collected behind a dam. So a reservoir is like a man-made lake behind a dam. So a dam and reservoir system can capture and store runoff and release it as needed, and that helps control floods. It could also help generate electricity, which is called hydroelectricity. It could supply water for irrigation and for towns and cities when you have that reservoir that you created behind the dam. And also the reservoir can help by providing recreational activities such as swimming, fishing, and boating. And here is a dam. And then behind it is the reservoir water because you're cutting off the, the natural flow of a river. So you end up, the water flows down the river and then it gets stopped by the dam. So behind the dam, you are allowing the water to pool. So that's gonna be your reservoir and this is your dam. And this is an example of hydroelectric power being created at a dam. So the water from the reservoir is going through this little area here, spinning a turbine, which then creates electricity. So there are disadvantages and advantages to dams and reservoirs. The world's 45,000 large dams have increased the annual reliable runoff available for human use by nearly 33%. Negative effects of dams include the displacement of people. So in order to build the dam and to create the reservoir behind the dam, around the world we've had 40 to 80 million people become displaced from their homes. By creating the reservoir behind the dam, it could flood areas that were previously productive land. Now also, organic matter builds up in the reservoir behind the dam, and that organic matter is coming downstream in the river. And then it decomposes and it generates methane gas, which is a very strong greenhouse gas and then that's emitted into the atmosphere. Other negative effects of dams include that rivers slow down when they reach a reservoir behind the dam, and then the river water is gonna drop sediment that it was carrying, and it drops that sediment into the reservoir. So then, 
the sediment is not going to reach the coast. So by the coastline, you end up getting a loss in coastal wetlands and beaches because you still continue to have coastal erosion, but you're not having the replenishment of sediment coming down the river. Now, along with that, you're going to have reservoirs that will fill up with sediment. Typically, this could happen within 50 years. And then eventually, if it fills with sediment, it's going to be useless for storing water or for hydroelectric power. So then the sediment has to be dredged out. Another negative effect of dams is that it disrupts fish migration. We talked about that a few chapters ago where um, I showed you a little video about a fish ladder. It was like a tube and they were putting salmon in it and then it was allowing the fish to go over the dam and continue down the river. So this just shows you a summary of the advantages in green and the disadvantages in orange of all of the um, different aspects of dams. So then a closer look at the Colorado River Basin. The amount of water flowing to the mouth of the Colorado River has dropped dramatically due to the heavy use of dams, water withdrawal from water supplies within the watershed, and drought. And the mouth of a river is the end of a river. That's where the river ends in an ocean or a bay or a lake. Since the year 1960, the Colorado River has dwindled to a small sluggish stream by the time it reaches the Gulf of California. And this is a picture of the Glen Canyon Dam, which goes across the Colorado River. And Lake Powell lies behind the dam. That's the second largest reservoir in the whole United States. This is actually the same dam that I showed you a couple of minutes ago. Okay, so that's Lake Powell, the man-made lake, a reservoir. So this graph here shows you the amount of water that flows to the mouth of the Colorado River by year. So in 1910, you had about 32 or 33 billion cubic meters of water flowing to the end of the Colorado River. And then it slowly decreased. And then in 1935, they built the Hoover Dam. So now you had a lot less water. And then you had a little bit of an increase. And then in 1963, you had the Glen Canyon Dam built. And then for a while, you had almost no water, very, very minimal amounts of water. I wouldn't say it's almost none, but I would say it's very minimal compared to what it had been in the beginning of the graph. Then you had a jump again, and now it's pretty low, the amounts of water. Now, along with the dams, we also have a lot of withdrawals for agriculture and for use in urban areas where people need water. Also, prolonged drought can cause some of the variations in the graph as well. So it's not just like a line, right? It goes up and down depending on drought and agricultural use and um, just use in cities. So this map shows all the land where the water ultimately drains into the Colorado River. Again, that's the watershed, right? And that's the green section is the lower basin and the yellow is the upper basin of the Colorado River watershed. And there were two major reservoirs. We have Lake Mead behind the Hoover Dam. Right here's the Hoover Dam, that's Lake Mead. And Lake Powell behind the Glen Canyon Dam, which is right here. And 
they store about 80% of the water in the entire Colorado River basin. There are 14 dams in total in the area. Not all of them are shown in the map. Okay, but it's these little green arches. These are the dams, okay? But again, there were others that are not shown on the map. So because the Colorado River is heavily dammed, by the time the river reaches the Gulf of California, the amount of water flow is very minimal. This is Lake Mead. And Lake Mead has a receding level. And it shows you the, um, the top is the year 2007. And the bottom is the year 2014. And you could tell that the water level has gone down drastically in Lake Mead. Reservoirs will probably become too full of silt. Silt is a small sediment grain, a little bit larger than clay, but smaller than sand. And when, they, when the reservoirs become too full of silt, they can no longer be effective at generating hydroelectric power, and they can't really be used to provide fresh water for irrigation and drinking water for urban areas. Agricultural production would then drop sharply. Withdrawing more groundwater from aquifers is not a solution because the water tables in these areas that we're talking about are already very low. So many people in the region's cities would likely have to migrate to other areas. Then we have the topic of water transfers. In many cases, water has been transferred into various dry regions of the world for growing crops and other uses. Water transfers have benefited many people, but they have also wasted a lot of water and they have degraded ecosystems from the areas that the water was taken from. The Aral Sea was one of the world's largest saline lakes along the borders of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. So on the left, it's a satellite photo from 1976. And on the right, it's a satellite photo from 2009. And you could see most of the water is gone. And the shrinking of the Aral Sea is the result of a large scale water transfer project. In one of the driest, in one of the driest climates in Central Asia. Since 1960, large amounts of water have been diverted from the two rivers that normally supply water to the Aral Sea. The purpose was to grow crops by creating a large area of irrigated land. The white area, by the way, in the 2009 photo shows salt covered desert that used to be part of the Aral Sea. Then we have desalination. That's a method of increasing water supplies. We could increase water supplies by removing salt from seawater. That involves removing the dissolved salts from the seawater or from brackish water and then using it for domestic use. Now remember, brackish means diluted salt water in an estuary, for example. So there are two processes involved in desalination. Distillation, which involves heating the salt water until it evaporates, and that leaves the salt behind, and then you have the evaporated water is gonna condense as fresh water. Then you also have reverse osmosis that uses high pressure to force salt water through a membrane filter that has pores in it, and those pores are small enough to remove the salt. 
So that's a microfiltration process. Today, about 13,000 desalination plants operate in more than 125 countries, especially in the arid nations of middle, the Middle East, North Africa, the Caribbean, and the Mediterranean. So this is just an image that shows you the different steps involved in desalination. There are three major problems with desalination. The high cost, it takes a lot of money and energy. Number two, pumping large volumes of seawater through pipes and using chemicals to sterilize the water and control algae growth kills many marine organisms and also requires large inputs of energy to run the pumps. Also then number three is that the process creates huge quantities of salty wastewater that you'll have to then figure out what to do with all that excess salt, the, the wastewater, it's very salty. So what we could also do is just work on reducing the waste of fresh water. An estimated 66% of fresh water used in the world is wasted. The United States is the world's largest user of water. About half of the water drawn from surface and groundwater supplies is wasted. It is economically and technically feasible to reduce such water losses to only 15%, therefore meeting most of the world's water needs for the foreseeable future. Producers of chemicals, paper, oil, coal, primary metals, and processed food consume almost 90% of the water used by industry in the United States. Some of these industries recapture, purify, and recycle water to reduce their water use and water treatment costs. Most industrial processes could actually be redesigned to use much less fresh water and decrease the waste. Now flushing toilets with fresh water is actually the largest use of domestic water in the US. Standards have required that new toilets use no more than 1.6 gallons of water per flush. That's 6.1 liters. Studies show that 30 to 60% of the freshwater supplied in nearly all of the world's major cities in less developed countries is lost. And that's primarily through leakage in water mains, pipes, pumps, and valves. So fixing those leaks should be a high government priority and it would cost less than building dams or importing water to increase their freshwater supply fixing the leaks would cost less than building the dams to create a reservoir or importing water from elsewhere. Homeowners and businesses in water shortage areas can use drip irrigation. We talked about that in the previous lecture. That is an efficient way of irrigating People could also replace lawns with native plants that need little fresh water. So here's an example in Southern California. This is a garden where they planted native plants that are drought resistant and are suited for the dry climate of Southern California. So then you don't have to water the plants, you don't have to water a lawn, it's just these native plants that are okay with not being watered. About 50 to 75% of the slightly dirtied water from bathtubs, showers, sinks, dishwashers, and clothes washers in a typical house can be stored in a holding tank and then reused as what we call gray water. And gray water can be used to irrigate lawns and non-edible plants. 
It could also be used to flush toilets and wash cars. So in cases where you are not, you're not gonna eat the grass on your lawn, okay? So using the gray water would be okay. But of course, if you're gonna plant like an organic vegetable garden, you're not gonna use gray water. So this is how gray water systems work. So here's a bathtub, a sink, clothes washer. This is not a kitchen sink. Water used in kitchens and toilets are gonna go directly into the sewer, but something from the shower or the bathtub or the clothes washer, that ends up going in a tank. That's the used water, it's called gray water again, okay? And then from that tank, there could be a pump that comes out to water the lawn. Or then also be, you, you know, you could use that water to water plants in a garden or wash cars. Or it could be rerouted back into the home and used to flush toilets because technically you don't need pristine water to flush a toilet. You could use this gray water. So we can cut freshwater waste in industry and in homes. The relatively low cost of water in most communities can lead to excessive water use and waste. About one fifth of all US public water systems do not have water meters and charge a single low rate for almost unlimited use of high quality water. Many people who rent apartments are often not charged extra for their water use. So in that case, you're gonna have a very little incentive to conserve water because you're not really paying by your usage, it goes just included in rent. So if someone lives in an apartment I know New York City, like a lot of most of the places in New York City, that you don't pay for water usage, meaning you're not paying by the gallon of water that you use. So, is there a reason why someone should not take a 20 minute long shower or a 30 minute long shower? They're not paying for that water any differently than what than if they took a five minute shower. So what's the incentive, right? What is what is the incentive to taking shorter showers or shutting off the faucet when you're brushing your teeth if you're not being charged for each gallon that you're using? So that's a large problem in conservation of water. So this is just a list of how we could try to reduce water waste. Okay, fix water leaks, raise water prices. Now I'm just seeing from it, the previous slide, the perspective of conservation coming from an economic standpoint. So if you're paying by the gallon, most people are going to conserve the water more than if you're just paying, if you're not paying for water at all. Getting a low flow toilet, different things. Okay, so you could read the rest. So this is a low flow, high efficiency toilet. Um, the one all the way on the left shows you a pre 1980s toilet which uses more than five gallons per flush. Modern, like if you were gonna get a modern brand new toilet, they are designed to use a lot less water. So it could use about 1.28 gallons per flush. Now they also make this new type of toilet where you can choose which button you wanna press. So the large button is gonna use more water to flush, and the small button is gonna use less water. So it's up to the user of the toilet to, to decide if they wanna, if they feel like they need to use one button over the other. 
Okay, and then this is a list of how we could use water more sustainably. Even changing a shower head to a low flow shower head, it's a way of using, of using less water. Repairing water leaks, showers instead of taking a bath, taking shorter showers. Okay, different things. So you could read through this. 